Today we're uh, continuing along in the, with the gospel. Last week we were in the gospel of Mark. This week we're still in the gospel of Mark. We're just jumping right along into the next text. Uh, so today I'm going to be preaching over Mark chapter 3, uh, verses 20 uh, through 35. And uh, we'll look back at uh, the beginning of chapter 3. If you remember, uh, last week we ended with the man with the withered hand. Um, uh, Jesus is preaching or healing him in the, in the synagogue. And how the, 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 the scribes and the Pharisees were trying to look for a way after that and the Herodians uh, to, to kill him. And we talked about that uh, last week. Um, there's also, after that, Jesus is preaching a multitude of the, of the side of the sea. And right after that, Jesus appoints the 12 disciples in God, Mark's gospel. And uh, the verse 19, which is leading into this, uh, ends with, then he went home. So here he is probably in Capernaum, uh, probably back at Peter's home, uh, is probably where he's at. But at, any, but at any rate, this is taking place back wherever Jesus has been using as his, as his home at that point in time. Uh, so with that, we're going to jump into to Mark's Gospel at, in the third chapter, verse 20 and going to 35. And the crowd came together again so that they could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain him, for people were saying he has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Belizebo, and by the ruler of the demons he casts out demons. And he called them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then, indeed, the house can be plundered. Truly, I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they had said, he has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him, they said to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And he replied, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. Now, in Scripture, there are those places where we have either uh, difficult or, or, or uh, troubling uh, verses. Um, here in Mark, we have a number of things that could be a little troubling and, or perhaps even problematic for us uh, from a theological standpoint, perhaps. But at any rate, as we first read through that, there are a number of things that, that can kind of set us off kilter a little bit. Um, First of all, it does happen in the house. There's so many people in the house that are saying that they can't even eat. They don't have room to even eat. You can imagine that. Um, and his family has come because they are thinking he's out of his mind with all of this going on. And, of course, that's a little unsettling to think that Jesus' own family thinks, thinks he has lost his mind. So that we can find a little unsettling. Next, we can find it a little unsettling that the scribes and the Pharisees uh, are going so far as to accusing uh, Jesus of being from Belizebub, uh, who is a, which is a derivative of the name that kind of evolved from the god the god Baal, which is the Syrian god, a, Palestine, a god in Palestine, uh, and it, it, it evolved into that name of, of Belizebub or Belizebub, uh, depending on which which translation you're looking at. Um, it either means God on high or God of the flies depending on which, which translation you're looking at. But it's a, it's a foreign God, and they're saying by this foreign God, and they, they, he had evolved into being a, a, one of the, uh, basically a figure of evil in their, in their, in their uh, way of thinking. Uh, not quite yet to the point of being Satan, but close to it. Um, and so he's saying you know, that the fact that the scribes would accuse him of being uh, his power coming from that, that foreign God 
But that's a little troubling to us, that they would, they would do that if, if we think about it in that way. Jesus goes on to rebuke them, and, and that is, I don't find that troubling. But then we go on further, and Jesus then says, But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then indeed the house can be plundered. And of course, he's talking about Satan. Or, and he's, remember, he's came out of the wilderness, and he's defeated Satan and the, and the temptation. So he's referring back to that. But it is troubling to think that Jesus is going to tie someone up and plunder them. And so that's difficult to us. Um, so these are things that are difficult there. Um, but it's, what he's getting at is that he's defeated, he's defeated this force of evil, is what he's getting at. And that now we can go forth and, and, and do the will of God. Uh, then he comes into verse 28 and he talks about the unforgivable sin, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. We should all find it troubling that there might be a sin that's unforgivable. Of course, I've oftentimes said that you know there's only one unforgivable sin, and that's not totally unforgivable. Uh, but but the point here is, I think that he's trying to get at in that is that apart from the Holy Spirit, there is no forgiveness. So it's not that it's that you're not going to be unforgiven if you blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. The way I take it away, it's that if you never get back into the, to the graces of the Spirit, then you're not forgiven. So we need to be in communion with God. We need to be in that relationship. That relationship is the utmost importance. And I've always said that the Bible is a book of relationships. And so I'll continue with that thought. <coughs> Probably for the remainder of my life. So at any rate, but I want to get to the point that I really want to preach upon, and that's when we get back to the true kindred of Jesus. And what we've got here is this Mark's, you know, Mark has this, this style of writing in him where he makes what they call a sandwich. Uh, and he'll put something at the beginning, he starts off with the family, and he ends with the family. And usually the important part we talk about is, is the, what's in the middle. But here I want to talk about the, the, the end caps, the family. So there he's saying, uh, from, uh, uh, okay, 34, or excuse me, and he replied in 33, and he replied, who are my mother and my brothers? And some, some uh, manuscripts say sisters there as well. And looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. As I told the children, talked to the children and you know, asked them who had families. Well, uh, all of us have, have families. Some of us, unfortunately, don't have families that are living. Uh, but there are orphans out there that don't have any living relatives. But everyone has some family that they may have passed. But all of us have family. And we belong to one another. We, we feel that, that, that kinship. Uh, in fact, next week, uh, weekend on, on Saturday, I'm going to make a long trip getting back here from Saturday night to Sunday morning. But I'm going to be up in South Dakota with my cousins from my mother's side of the family. And uh, these are relatives I rarely see. Some of them I haven't seen since I was a little, little kid. Uh, the size of even Lucas, perhaps. I don't. I, I, I know I've met them, but I don't remember them at all, to be honest, which is sad. But we all have these families that, that, we're, that we're related to. And what Jesus is getting at here is that we have to remember that, I'm going to back up just a little bit, we have to remember that in his culture, family is so much more important than it is to us today. There, I wouldn't have cousins back in that day that I hadn't seen since I was little. They would live, live close together geographically, most for the most part. Very would have been a rare occurrence for them not to be close to their families. And this is why when Jesus packs up and moves on and leaves the family business behind, that's a big deal. First of all, the family is probably relying on him to, to be a breadwinner. We don't know what you know about if there was a spouse or anything, and we people speculate on that. But nonetheless, he had a mother, and he's he's the eldest. He's in charge of taking care of his mother. So him moving on and leaving the family business, the carpenter business, stoneworking business, whatever we believe it might be, because the, the word that was carpenter could mean uh, as a craftsman, could be many things. But he has left the business, and he's left the family. Uh, he's gone out. And that would be a big deal in that time. Big, much bigger than us. We, we, don't, uh, we don't have that same 
stress in our lives about family moving away as they would have had in that. So it would be a huge deal uh, to Jesus or to Jesus' time. So what he's getting at here, the family, uh, once these people would have gone on to take on the trappings of, of Christianity as a, the, that newest form of the Jewish sect, some of them would have been abandoned by their families. It's much like in today's world, if we were to look at the Muslim religion. Now, if someone goes from Islam and becomes a Christian, they, for the most part, especially in the very orthodox Muslim countries, are going to be completely ostracized. They will have lost their family. They will now, though, be part of the family of Christ. So they're adopted in. And many of these people in Mark's time that Mark's preaching is to, and that's one of the things I guess I want to get back to, is why is Mark talking about <coughs> this story? Mark's talking about this story because he's talking to people that have become Christians. And for some of them, if they were Jewish, some of the Jewish people wanted nothing to do with them. Depending on when Mark has written, it may, it may have been after or it may not have been after the curse was implemented upon the Christians by the synagogues, and they were thrown out of the synagogue. So at any rate, these people are being ostracized by their families if they're Jewish. If they're Gentile, more than likely they're ostracized by their families too because they're, they're, they've left behind the pagan gods. So they've been, the, these family ties are broken. And again, in that day and age, in that culture, family is so much more important to us than it is to, to, to us today, as important as it is to us. We don't, we have a difficult time grasping the depth and the, and the importance of family in that day. So here we have that breaking. And how do we apply that to our lives? Well, sadly, in the culture that we live in today, it's becoming more and more common uh, for people not to be Christian, isn't it? And it's becoming more and more problem, pro common for us to be looked down upon as Christians. And so that can divide families. As I get together with my brothers and, and sisters and cousins, uh, there are some of us, there's two of us that are ministers. Some of us are Christians. Some of us are not. You know, I have a sister that was a nun and is no longer a Christian. No longer wants anything to do with me. So in that, in that family dynamic, there is some, there is some bro brokenness, isn't there? There's some division. And some, some topics you just can't talk about. And we have that today in our families. All of us, we think about it. We probably think of someone in our families that's not a, not a believer and might be very, very adamantly ambitious towards the concept of Christianity and organized religion in general. My sister has gone beyond, beyond just Christianity. All organized religion is bad. Um, so we have to do, look at that. We have to think, you know, what do we do? We cling to each other. Because all of us, as I talk to the children about, all of us are part of God's family. And the important people, when we're dealing with our Christian faith, I don't want you to ostracize your family by any means, but the important people we need to cling to in our Christian faith are each other. Because each of us are the ones that, that, that help strengthen us to each other, we help renew each other, we help hold each other up when we are in times of weakness, when we have loss, we cling to one another. We are all God's children. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for the blessing of, of, of Christ. We thank you so very much for the blessing of being one of your children. We ask that you might help us and guide us and, and help us to see the way to, to continue to grow in our relationship to you and to help to spread to others and those in our families that have left, left the Christian faith or have never been uh, we ask that you give us the strength and, and, and the wisdom as to how to best to reach out to them, to try to either bring them to or to bring them back to a relationship with you, Lord. We know that that is the most important part of our life here in this world, is our relationship with you. We pray all of this in your love and in your glory. Amen.